Welcome to this week's Fireside Chat with Jesse. I am joined today by Steve Seiler, Director of Technology for Eldridge. Thanks for joining me, Steve. Thanks for having me, Jesse. Appreciate it. No, nah, it's great to have you on here, man. Miss you uh, formally in the equipment finance industry. It was, um, I think I get to like maybe earmark one time a year where I can see you at the Stonebriar event. Yeah. But, uh, I'll have to figure something else out. Maybe I'll get up to Connecticut. Yeah, if you, if you come up to New York or Connecticut or whatever, uh, <laughs> we'd love to have you. But yeah, definitely. Being a former Northeasterner, like I'm up there for a selected period of time, then it's like, up back to Arizona. The summer. <laughs> <laughs> we actually the 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 oceans on the other side of this wall and uh, we live like 10 minutes from the beach so the summer's perfect yeah. time um so like that was one of the things that appealed to us of where we we moved to where like hey we can like have pizza on the beach on a friday night which just sounds fun right no oh, that's that sounds fantastic yeah what we do only way we're going to get a beach here is if California falls into the ocean, which uh, yeah, there's, there's yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> Never know. Never know. But um, Steve, for those people who are watching that might not be familiar with you, do you mind just kind of introducing yourself and your career to date? Sure. So um, I'm Steve Seiler. Um, I'm director of technology, obviously, but also um, I've been in the leasing industry, I believe, around 17 years now. Um, or around it, right? So right out of business school, actually even before that, let, let me backtrack a little bit. So my dad um, was head of logistics for electric companies and bought like 4,000 rail cars from Johnstown, America throughout his career. Actually, I think it was closer to 7,000, but like he was he was shipping coal all the time over rail and was leasing them to and from all of the, the rail leasing companies. So I remember when I was 10 years old, crawling in a rail car, I was like, this is kind of cool. So <laughs> um, after business school, like it took me a little while to find out like who I wanted to be as a person. So uh, I had a stint in like director of aquatics for like YMCA's and swim lesson programs <laughs> and stuff. So it was just like, it was weird. And then I was like, all right, well, I, I need to be able to support a family. Um, and that wasn't cutting it. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go to night school, put myself through that. Um, and then right after business school, I graduated and I got a job at AIG's leasing business back in like 06, 07. Um, so did a large stint there. And, and we had a small like SWAT team where I learned a lot of operations, um, accounting, portfolio, mechanical, like like every single unit that was there, I was kind of like listening and absorbing everything I possibly could. Um, and then there was also a technology component as well, where I was like, all right, well, like how can we wrap around technology around this? So as a part of like, uh, AIG had a deal with Salesforce and they're just like, here's 10 licenses, do with them whatever you want. And we ended up building a very cool contract and asset management platform on top of, of Salesforce, where like we had all of our contractual language tagged from, you know, four or 500 contracts and then tagged with um, like, this is return provisions and those types of things that are are typical in our industry. And sure. um, like, it was really cool. And then like, I, I just got a little tired. So you'll see a theme in a second. Um, <laughs> so then I got a call from an investment bank based out of Chicago. And um, then I spent five years there, but not just focused on investment banking, I grew into like private wealth, other types of asset management, institutional sales, um, trading, debt capital markets. Like it, I got a lot of, I got a lot more technical experience there, and I got a lot of breadth on like how the the financial services industry works, like all the different counterparties. I was able to then absorb that. So after about five years of doing that, I got hired again um 
So yeah. the the team, some of the team that was at AIG had spun off and had this like new um, new company called Stonebriar Commercial Finance. Maybe some people have heard of it. Um, and they asked me to come down. Uh, the first time they asked me to come down to, to Dallas, I wasn't ready. I was still learning a lot. It was within that five-year period. I, I just, I didn't want the change. Um, right. But they asked me again. I was like, all right, let's do it. So literally said, gave my notice, which was heartbreaking because the people at the, the investment bank, I, I loved working with them. Um, really good people from that industry's perspective, right? Um, sure. And uh, came down and ended up uh, growing my role at Stonebriar, being their their only technology person, and was CTO there for three years. So, um, and the responsibilities there were also like building out a similar platform that I mentioned previously, integrations to a lot of the industry providers that that we've used there, um, which is where we met. Um, yep. And uh, then was working on like business intelligence and analytics. I also graduated with an undergrad in graphic design. So like um, was also working through marketing and like all of these other like literally random pieces because Stonebriar is also a small group. And we basically work as a SWAT team to make sure that any job that comes up needs to get done to be able to service the customers, clients, et cetera. So um really enjoyed my time there and then um midway through my tenure uh i got tapped on the shoulder to come up to the holding company which is where eldridge is um and they're like well we want you to do a couple things take a look at some investments that we have uh at least the technology component things that are complicated that sort of thing if you have like, you know, recommendations that you can give to some of our existing investments, go for it um, and like build relationships there. And then also we have like all of this information and we don't know what to do with it. Um, let's try to figure it out. I mean, every company has that problem, right? It's not unique. Right. Um, so was doing that for the last two years. And then earlier this year, um, expanded the role into like minimize some parts of the role and expanded others. And now I have like the, I'm the day-to-day -day person for like networking, hardware, questions on like, is a conference room like enabled? And we just didn't, uh, um, we just spun up a new office where like we were doing everything from scratch too. And now with these, with the way technology is today, there's a lot of tech involved in an office space so like sure. um, it's just like trying to keep your hand on all the wheels and making sure the plates are spinning but not only that though it's anytime something goes wrong and 90 percent of the time well 99 percent of the time it's uh user error it all comes down to you like we're i always call it loose behind steve, the keyboard I, I, <laughs> I, I can't this isn't working blame steve it's like no it's not his fault <laughs> <laughs> It, if you build goodwill in your in your relationships with people, they're not going to blame you. So like the you you try to develop like a partnership with these people. And like even though like there's a frustrating period, the fact that you have like a personal relationship with with it helps that part go smoother. That's one of the things that I've learned in my career. It's like develop the relationships. One of one of Dave's mantras when we were at Stonebriar was just take the meeting right to like build relationships with people so sure. like I, I apply that both externally and internally that was one of the things on on the pandemic for me where that i've always been on the business development side so you go in there and you try to do a demo or you try to give a presentation you're in a bank right but you can't get on the internet because it's locked down you can't have a thumb drive because you can't do that so there's all these different hoops you have to jump through and some of the people would get so frustrated and they'd blame you and it's like come on and then you know Fast forward to people who are no longer in the offices and these guys can't figure out how to use Zoom. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, one of the, when the, when the pandemic first came around, like Dave was very nervous about uh, Zoom and was like, can you come and press the button for me to make sure that my kid, he had some valid concerns because like sure. 
wanted the camera to work. He wanted the audio to work. Like he has like a very he has a very specific type of um, vision that he wants to present. That sure. like he's fully capable for everything. He just wanted additional comfort to be able to sure. execute on this too. So like there was a, a small learning curve there, and um, like we got through it. We also put in some really cool tech um, in our boardroom at the time, there was this thing that like had a camera in the center and with everybody having to be like 15 feet apart from each other, we actually like were able to get the video of people within this this one thing called like a meeting owl or something like that. Um, so so we, we did whatever we had to do during that time. <laughs> we all have PTSD from it. That's that's fantastic. And circling back to your first job out of college, director of aquatics. Yeah. Like, was that like Baywatch inspired or just were you like, um, oh, that's right. Never mind. I, I know your background, but. Yeah, I was, I was, a, I, was um, I was a nationally and internationally ranked swimmer. So like I, doing that, like in your early 20s, you're not necessarily lost, but you don't know what the pathway sure. that you should take is. And I, I look back at that as like, all right, well, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. But if I look at like the experience that I got, I learned how to budget. I learned how mm -hmm. to save money, money on those budgets. I managed like 80 people that so like I had and I was like a kid myself. And I'm I'm like managing people, customer service, lesson plans, which like is you know just like str strategic type of initiatives. Like, sure, you you take a look back and you're like, well, yeah, I did that, but the skills that you acquire throughout your career like apply and manifest in like a completely different way, um, sure. which is just like really fun for me to figure out because I. I'm a I'm the type of person that always tries to improve myself. And like, if you can figure out, you know, all right, this is a lesson learned and this is how I can for, like fix it for the next time I have to do it. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's good for you throughout. Nope, nope, that's same, same page. So, um, you know, so you're at Eldridge now. Do you mind just kind of introducing that organization, Steve? Sure. So, um, so Eldridge is kind of a, a PE firm, holding company, investment firm type of uh, company. We we focus on uh, everything across like the investment spectrum. So like a lot of times you have like a, a credit or a special situations type focused fund and that sort of thing. So we're, we're not like that. So we take advantage of whatever opportunities that there are in market and um, invest in that. We also don't have your typical PE like a uh, holding period where um, you like typically PE companies have like a three or to five year fund window that they have to like sure. return capital back <laughs> and that sort of thing. But um, Eldridge is in it for the long haul and, and we're more of a holding company where like we make an investment and in companies that we feel like we can make a difference in and then use our internal expertise to be able to help develop those management teams and those companies to something more than where they were whenever we made that initial investment. Not to say that we don't divest out of companies because we do, but like we don't have a mandate that we have to. There's no like time bomb or like fuse, if you will, for us to um, have to to exit an investment. If it's something that we like, we'll go ahead and, and continue to put effort and, and grow those companies to where they, they need to go. Which is definitely non-traditional PE where it's like, oh. you got three to five years, we're gonna shake this thing up and then- and, and if you think about like where I came from in rail, um, <laughs> that's like typical industrials, investment banking, but but like the, the strategies here there's a financial um services component there's a real estate component there's consumer and retail um not just consumer and retail but like food and beverage and then like food products 
we have a little bit of healthcare tech, financial tech, then there's like a whole laundry list. And then there's like this whole entertainment space that I am not familiar <laughs> with. Um, <laughs> and I'm just like, all right, well, like, sometimes, do you ever get those messages on LinkedIn where they're like, hi, Steve, I have, or hi, Jesse, I have an opportunity um, in market. Please find all of the information attached. And it's like a total cold call. And you're like, did you even look at who I am? Or did you just see the the name of the company? And you're just like, yeah, I'm just going to hey, work. Hey, 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 apparently. Well, are you that consulting... person? You're that person, aren't you? Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Apparently, my new consulting company needs a balance sheet from, from leases and loans because I'm still getting those idiots that are like, oh, yeah. we can help you. Or I, I'm like, no, no. Yeah, you didn't look at the Thank website, you. man. Um... <laughs> nice try. Thank you. <laughs> So what's it like going from, I guess, one organization um, to now where you're managing or have relationships with everyone? Like yeah, you, you just you mentioned say, all those right, different it's industries. It's more of a relationship. And, and it, you see this like broad um, view of people that are like you's point of view where it's, it's a collaborative effort. And like, we're all dealing with the same problems, like I mentioned before. And I, I would say like 36 months ago, I didn't have a strong opinion of what you would use AWS versus GCP versus Azure for. Like I didn't, I didn't have that opinion. I do now. Um, and, and it's based <laughs> off of what's happened in the last couple of years, right? And like people hearing people like, oh, I use this for application development. And this is really good for business intelligence queries. And I like this for identity and cyber is over here. And you're like, okay, well, like based off of hearing 25 people's points of view, like I can... I'm not saying that I'm going to steal their work, but I, I appreciate their them being able to have a dialogue about it and oh. like then help me formulate my point of view as well. And then I can relay that that where they don't have that relationship to another company and be like, oh, well, this this other company handled that in that way. Have you thought about it in that? Because I'm always like a, a problem solver type of person where like I want to make sure that I can help with the change and make sure that the change is impactful for a company. Um, yeah. And and seeing different versions of the same problem helps with that initiative overall. Sure. And especially the other people's perspective. And then, you know, you're you're probably taking that into consideration, but not actually yeah, you just have to just going have to empathize based with off them. Yeah. 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 That's big. That's big. Um, so from I guess from a tech perspective then or you know what are you seeing from a trend um you know in the industry more do you want to be more i guess bleeding edge cutting edge or i guess just overall technology there's some really interesting thing. things out there like if you were looking at like two three years ago everybody was talking about crypto and the thing that's not interesting or that's interesting about crypto isn't like bitcoin like that's that is um another asset of the same type of thing but there's this whole transformation now of like tokenizing real assets and trying to there's there's some tried and true financial structures that exist in the equipment leasing business if you take a look at securitizations um and like some of bonds issued and that sort of thing there is now opportunity to basically do something similar in in a blockchain based smart contract based environment where that technology wasn't like it was ble uh, bleeding edge about two, three years ago, but now there are platforms in place that allow you to be able to transact. And like there's there's some really interesting ideas out there that are in market that are very cool. Like I'm seeing, uh, one of our sister companies is an insure tech and they're doing uh, life and annuity policies on a smart contract blockchain. And mm -hmm. they're finalizing that to go to market right now. Um, it's very like, it's not equipment leasing. 
but like <laughs> it's a, another boring industry that is <laughs> ripe for change. Um, <laughs> Come on, man. Life insurance. Everyone has that. No, no, no. <laughs> like um, when I first started thinking about this like tokenization thing, I was at um, the ELFA conference like a couple years ago and there was a presentation. It, it was it was a John Deere presentation. And that that turned on a, a light bulb for me where like, oh, wait, you're producing all of these parts. All of those parts go into uh, like a combine or a tractor. Sorry, my my parents came from a farm so like i i'm intimately aware of farm equipment right i, I don't i don't um, mind the analogy it's fine right so like you have you have the the producer of the parts you have the producer of the equipment you have um a a sales arm of that equipment and then you have a financing arm of that equipment then you have your mechanical and repair uh network uh, on top of it with more parts and then you have your counterparties that are all interacting. And then you have a reseller's market, right? So if, like I literally listed like eight, nine things or something like that of like different components. And if all of that is tokenized, you're basically saying that one thing is like one piece and it doesn't have to go from system to system to system. You could basically are enabling access to that singular record wherever you are in the in the life cycle of that asset so like it it makes the most sense for something like that but those are incredibly hard to stand up and have like public buy-in but like we're getting closer sure. to that um also on the the bleeding edge front like everybody that should be investigating generative ai everybody's heard of chat gpt um, I've been doing a lot of testing around that. There's some certain things that you need to be careful about, about like privacy and personally identifiable information. Um, so you want to make sure that you're not um, releasing anything in the wild that you shouldn't. But there's a lot of um, interesting things that are happening there. Like, and even just off the shelf, like, I know we're on a, a recording right now. Uh, I've tested out the Zoom uh, transcription service, right? And that's just being able to enable people to focus on the conversation and not have to take notes, right? It, it's just like a, a small fundamental change that sure. can, can allow me to connect with you more as a person, even though it's through a screen, instead of having to be over here just typing like what we're talking about for me to review sure. later. Like I, that's an incremental push into productivity that like we're, we're in the middle of right now. No, that's fantastic. And just so you know, I grew up on 300 acres of farmland in upstate New York. So I don't think you probably knew that about me or not. So I did definitely not. can relate to that analogy. But um, now with some of that transcription service, like in theory, does that make it a recording then? And it does. like from a privacy perspective, do we need to have consent prior to going into some of these meetings? It's like it, I had to click got it before you started recording, and that is my consent. Oh, did you know that? Okay, I, I guess I never. I, I've always been on the other side of it, so I. I don't think I've ever been on the. Yeah, other yeah. Side. It's it's uh like it, yes, yes. You have to consent. Um, the, the other, the, the yes and component of that, I don't know if you know improv, but yeah, I'll build on that comment too. There's like a sharing component and a privacy component that once you have this recording of me, like, what do you do with that? Is that own internal to you and your organization, or are you going to share that out with others? And that is another thing that you have to think through before you do that when you record somebody. Interesting. And is there local laws that you have to comply with? So like, it's always a legal discussion, isn't it? Ah, just spam it out there and let everyone else deal with it. It's fine, whatever. Ask for forgiveness, <laughs> not for <permission. laughs> uh, It's fantastic. Yeah, the whole the whole chat GBT is, it's an interesting thing is especially, uh, you know, the business development side where you're sitting there and you're coming up with statements of work and everything else. And then it's like, Hey, make this for me. Just give a little tidbit here and there, and all of a sudden it just populates. It's like that would have taken me a couple hours to figure that thing have out. Seen, Thank you. 
have you seen the document processing ones? There's like a hundred pages or so that they can now ingest and then give you a summary. There was a contract that I, I put in that was is public. So I'm not trying to like get out. Right, there, right, like, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it, it had, it was hit or miss on a couple things, but it was relatively good. And I was able to find for the misses why it missed. And I was like, mm. all right. I can I can see, there was a there was a, a term loan and a revolver component, and there was like two different numbers, and it did the average of the two, right? So like, it just got confused. It saw a thirty and a twenty, and it's like, which one is it? I'll just give you twenty five. Split the diff. I always just like go in every now and then. I'll use if it gives me four paragraphs, I'll use like two and a half. But it's so, you always have to go and you you have to make modifications. Summarize it. I also tell it to be like, and now talk to you, me like an executive at a third, <laughs> at a third grade reading level. <laughs> Otherwise, you sound like you're Borat, given like this thing of why I should be doing this. <laughs> That's fantastic. Next thing we know, we got to add a voice to it. <laughs> they have that too. They do. Oh no. They have no. one where it's like videos. They'll take your generated script that you did. And then like like we could be two totally different people. Um lovely. <laughs> I'll be the Terminator and you can be, I don't know, like Pikachu or something like that. I'm sure I'm sure my missus would be appreciate that. Just make me say Pika Pika over and over again. <laughs> yeah. There you go. We're talking about leasing. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's fantastic um you know you went from chicago to texas and then texas to connecticut within like a what four year window yeah three, three year four window? years somewhere on there yeah there and, then, and then and then you moved i think during covid correct yeah we did it was it was tough I was going to say, so what, what does that do to, um, you know, a younger family of, we have four, five, four? I have, I have three kids, so it's a family of five. five. Yeah. Um, so like the, my wife and I grew up in Chicago, we were Chicago people. We're like, we bought a house in the same town that we grew up in. We're five minutes from both my parents and her parents. It was like slam dunk. And then we had the opportunity with Stonebriar and I was like, all right, well, we got to move to Dallas. Um, moving down there was relatively easy. Um, we we came in, we found a house in a weekend, uh, which is weird, um, and moved in uh, a couple weeks later. And we had actually had the summer to get used to our surroundings. But during that summer, our air conditioning broke and it was like 120 degrees in Dallas and it was terrible. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and my wife was just like, where did you move me to? This is like the face of the sun. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. hot. Yeah. Um, but like, we we built a sense of community there. My parents ended up moving down like 10 minutes from our house and it, it was great to have them down there um and like we felt very welcoming and then when we were there like covid started and like we were in lockdown and after after a couple months texas was like ah just kidding right um and <laughs> and they started to venture out and and knowing what we know now like that was probably okay because you were outside you were not near people like you you took additional precautions and that sort of thing sure. um the the other piece of it during lockdown was like all right well now we need to to think about moving and um again texas uh we like i have high blood pressure i don't know if this complies with hipaa laws or whatever but um <laughs> like that qualified me to get the vaccine early so <laughs> as soon as i i was vaccinated i started coming up to connecticut to be able to uh, work with my team here because we had different yeah. protocols here, but um, we wanted to make sure that there was some FaceTime involved with it. So I started doing every other week in Connecticut and that travel was like a little jarring. We still had the support from my parents, but COVID was still locked down. 
Um, and then uh, like we we started looking for a house and we came here and and my wife and I found an amazing home that that like we feel lucky that we did because I live about 10, 15 minutes from the office here. Um, and having a sense of community, community, my wife was a public school teacher. So like having public schools that are very good and important, those were all sure. like key things. But when we moved here, we moved here the day before um, school started. So we didn't, we didn't have this like accommodation piece. Everybody was still kind of in lockdown from a public uh, perspective. The kids had to wear masks to school. So like they only saw each other's eyes um, and didn't see like smiles or, or frustration. They had been away sure. from other children for a year. So there was a lot of growing pains there. And a lot of what happened breaking into COVID is that there's like, there were bubbles that were formed and relationships that were had during this and coming in as somebody new you're outside of that group um and it, it felt very like high school clicky type of thing and intentionally or not um sure. you're 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 feeling that and you're feeling frustration with that and also you're in like we live in greenwich and it's like very closed off anyway um i'm, I'm being nice right now um <laughs> Hey, I drive through Greenwich and they're like, sir, you're not welcome. Go away. Go away. That, that's essentially <laughs> like I, I tried to go to the beach that I mentioned and they're like, you have a Texas plate. You're not allowed here. Um, <laughs> I'm like, I'm a resident. Residents are allowed. Here's my pass. Um, they're like, you have to get a Connecticut plate. Go. Uh, side <laughs> note, actually, the, the license plates fund the uh, public parks system in okay. Connecticut. So like they had a reason, but like, come on. Um, so like it was it was tough to break into this, but um, after being here for, or living here almost a year and a half, two years, there's some like serendipity and relationship building that we've had um, that are is nice. Just as an example, yesterday, one of the companies I support had previously introduced me through email to this guy who's a cybersecurity expert. And I was like, yeah, I'll take the meeting, whatever. Um, get on the phone with him yesterday. I'm like, you're Luke's dad. And his twins are best friends with my 11 year old. And I see him all the time. <laughs> and like, <laughs> so like there's this, there's this like breaking into community thing that after sure. after a year and a half, two years, you're just like, all right, well, I feel more comfortable in my abilities to build relationships. Um, and and it's happening organically. That's uh that's fantastic. I mean, I moved out here from the northeast in 2010. Um and you know, just kind of solo by yourself, and then you slowly start to build that sense of community and everything else. Everything mm -hmm. just takes some time. Yeah, but it does not happen. Yeah. When we moved to Dallas, um, one of the wives of a coworker that I I work with, she said she told my wife, uh, wait two years, um, and if you still don't like it after two years, or you don't have that sense of community after two years, like or Fair. starting to feel it, like then that Fair. is your signal that you don't necessarily like um, belong there, or and you should start figuring out like what makes sense for you for your family, so. <laughs> We're, we're coming up on that. We'll see what my wife says in a couple months. <laughs> perfectly, perfectly fair. Um, so, you know, you've been up there for a few years now. Um, you know, just thoughts on kind of like the equipment finance industry. I mean, I know you still communicate with the guys from Stonebriar frequently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do you miss that industry? Um, Obviously, you know, like the, the equipment finance industry is like a, a microcosm and meaning in my sense of this, it's like a small knit group of people that understand and see each other often and like have very good relationships. I, I've i seen, I've, since I had been in the industry for such a long time, I kind of miss that, right? Um, the There's a different like relationships that I'm building through 
through the New York community with like some hedge funds and that sort of thing. And it's too soon to tell if it's like that. I, I get a feeling that it's like a little bit different, but um, the equipment leasing piece has just been terrific. And I very much enjoyed being a part of that and having open dialogue and discussion about certain issues that we want to make sure that we cover. Nobody's giving away secret sauce if you tell them that you've done something because sure. all of this stuff takes work. And the where you have to like actually plug in, plug in the wire to the thing is like the hardest thing possible. So like, <laughs> like if you if you said that you plugged in a phone, um, you're like, yeah, I did too. Was it? Did you have to turn it this way or that way? Like, like everybody's different, and right. being able to talk through the that you're doing something, it you're not giving anything away. So there's not necessarily a harm in it, in doing it, um, unless you're trying to like literally grab code and like take it from mm -hmm. one place to another. Like that's a little suspicious. Sure. But like, sure. um, we we all have the same type of issues that we're working through. Yeah, and um, you know, one question I wanted to ask you as well was from a technology perspective. And my blinders are kind of on, Steve, because it's been 18 years and I was in retail for 18 months after I graduated college before I got into equipment finance. So my blinders are definitely on when I say this. But, um, you know, from a technology, it's all about efficiency, speed, speed up process and everything else. But from what I'm seeing in equipment finance, there's still that handshake and relationship oh, that totally. needs to be there. And I wasn't sure if it's similar to other industries that you guys are in or not. Um, or how strong that bond is. Um, Cause we were at that Stonebriar event together last week and you just see like that sense of camaraderie. Where'd you go? What happened there? I don't know. No, I, I, you I, went I, away. I, you froze. You were like, <laughs> well, maybe. Well, I guess we'll see when I see the Zoom recording. So, anyhow, I, I was about to text you. Where'd you go? So, we almost made it through it. Um, anyhow, tech issues. Um, you should probably keep that in. <laughs> oh, no, I, absolutely. If I'm like that, I'm going to be like, eh, I do have a highlight reel that I keep for some of these things where it's like, oh, we're now we're gonna talk about this and the person raises. <laughs> Anyhow, I, I forgot my thought of where I was at. You were talking about but, camaraderie. Um, oh yeah, and, yeah. And, yes. that sort of thing, and handshakes yeah. in the industry and that sort of thing. And and you were also talking about how how like the event that we had last week is is a lot of the community coming together. And it's my understanding that that was the largest one that we had at the Stonebriar Investor Conference um, that we've ever had. And um, I know from my network and from the Stonebriar network, like all of these relationships matter and they're really important. And events like that help us be able to make sure that we continue those relationships on a go forward basis, make sure that those handshakes Make sure that we can trust each other, that we each have um, each other's interests in, at heart, both on the client side and on the leasing side, right? So like um, we have our reputations and we have like our word that we are going to do these things to get done on the tech side, on the financing side, on the delivery side, all of all of the pieces that we have, the, those are our, our word to be able to like uh, go forward. So. What? No, no, and I, and I see it. All right, Steve, so I ask everyone who uh, comes on here to give me a little fun fact 
um, you know, about themselves are in the fact that, you know, you're a world-class swimmer. Um, it's about that, you know, so, all right, well, let's, 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 let's go into that then. <laughs> all right. So, um, so I, I took off my 2000, um, school year to train for Olympic trials, totally choked learning experience, et cetera. Uh, it was, it was really tough. But uh, real, real I, quick, what is yeah. what is the definite what is the definition of choking? Uh, get not making uh, the team. I don't know. I was ranked like in the top five in the U.S. in the top twenty in the Euro, the world at the time, okay. um, and like I didn't even make it back to the next swim because I went out. I went out too fast. Uh, they had these new. Um, they had these new suits at the time, and like. I didn't know how they worked and it, it just wasn't right. It wasn't the right time. Like I, I should have probably started that training cycle six to nine months earlier. Like the, there was a lot there. Okay. I'm um, sorry. I was curious. No, no, totally. Uh, but it was, it was a good learning experience, but in my swimming career, as I was starting to retire, there was one summer where like, I was like, all right, um, this is my last summer. I'm just going to have fun. I'm just going to continue to see where I am. Cause there were the younger kids that were getting better and like coming up as well. And you, you see that behind you and you're like, all right, well, what am I going to do with my life? Um, and I actually tested positive for drugs and was one of the strikes against the U S swimming team during that. And it wasn't anything that was nefarious or anything like that. I, I had a cold, I took some Sudafed. I, I tested positive for Sudafedrin, which is a controlled substance. So like now I ended up having to do speeches at like the Olympic training center for the, the Olympic team to be like, all right, I am one of your strikes. Make sure you understand what you put in your body, that sort of thing. Um, so like I, I tested positive for drugs. Sorry, I'm laughing. Cold medicine. <laughs> Cold medicine. Like sesame seeds. Don't, don't, don't have those before I get in. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, sorry sorry to hear that. But no, it's, it, it, it's like, part of my life story, so like, like, like whatever. <laughs> Just imagine getting that call where it's like, seriously? Yeah, uh, you're, like, you have yeah. a two-month suspension. I'm like, fine, I, I guess. Sure. Can I still swim at the end of the summer? They're like, yeah, and I'm like, all right. Well, I wasn't planning on doing any meets until then, anyway. So, good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's fantastic, Steve. Well, um, you know, it's always good seeing your face, man. Uh, appreciate your time sharing your story here, and um, you know, look forward to seeing you. I think we'll try to get you down to the golf tournament in early August. Awesome. Yeah, I love the conversation. Thank you, Jesse. Appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs>